Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, this is Shackleton the Explorer, who just loves to go into my plants and hide underneath them, and he thinks he's in the jungle. So, what I'm going to talk about in this video is, can we keep the Earth habitable? Okay, so in order to do that, we would obviously need to stabilize climate, and we're we're nowhere near stabilizing climate. In fact, we're in, you know, climate change is accelerating in all aspects and very soon it will threaten the global food supply, you know, our ability to grow food and feed the planet. So for a long period of time, I've been pushing for what I call the three-legged bar stool set of attempts to stabilize the climate. The first leg of that bar stool, of course, is to slash emissions, slash fossil fuel emissions. The second step, you know, that's not sufficient. Um, not only do we need to reduce it to zero, but we need to pull out about as much CO2 from the atmosphere each year as what we're presently putting in. So if we kept emissions at today's levels, we would need to remove twice as much as what we're putting in in order to reduce the, the net, the overall, by roughly what we're putting in per year. So we need to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's not just CO2, that's also uh, methane, CH4. Removal of the CO2 is often called carbon dioxide removal, but it's not just the CO2 um, that's the problem, it's also the methane. So we need negative emissions. Um, one of the things that people have been looking at is carbon capture and storage. You know, what do we do when we remove the CO2 from the atmosphere? If we pull it directly out of the atmosphere, then how do we store it away from, so that it doesn't affect, you know, get it out of the rapid, um, store it for a long period of time. I mean, because we always have to think about time scale and we also have to think about spatial scale. The third leg of the three-legged bar stool is that we need to deploy solar radiation management to cool the planet. Now, there's a number of different ideas on this, including things like cloud brightening. Okay, so if we brighten the low-level clouds, then that will reflect more of the solar radiation so reduce the solar radiation or the shortwave radiation that's hitting the Earth's surface and warming it up. Uh, one of the, another technique is uh, ISA, iron salt aerosols. And what this does is, I like this approach because, and I'll talk more about it um, in future videos, I'll talk about it in great detail, the engineering of it. But it reduces, it's a method that will reduce methane in the atmosphere it will increase the cloud reflectivity, so increase the albedo and reflect more of the shortwave solar radiation back up to space, causing cooling. And it will also seed the ocean with iron, and that will stimulate phytoplankton blooms, which will then absorb more and more CO2, reducing ocean acidification, but also reducing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Um, you know, another method of solar radiation management is to put sulfur dioxide up into the upper atmosphere, up into the stratosphere, and we know that this will cool the planet uh, because it ha because when large volcanoes go off, uh, the volcanoes that are powerful enough to, to inject sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere, that causes a cooling of the planet for three to five years. Um, people are looking at regrowing sea ice in the Arctic, okay, because the Arctic is warming so quickly. Um, we're losing sea ice and snow cover, so the Arctic is, will warm that much faster. Arctic temperature amplification, that reduces the temperature gradient to the equator, so the jet streams slow down and become wavier. My cat's causing problems here. So some of the ideas to um, restore sea ice is using, for example, wind turbines, 
to pump water onto the top of the ice so it freezes, so the ice can grow thicker in the winter and therefore last longer in the summer and have some of it left. Glass microbeads or nanobeads actually to put on the surface of the ice to increase the reflectivity. Um, and uh, th things like that, okay? Um, or increasing the amount of clouds over the Arctic to increase the albedo. So all of these things are things that I've discussed in the future. I'm just giving a recap. And again, all of these, any, anything that we do, we have to think of the time scale on which it will occur and the spatial scales. And is it scalable to um, have a global impact? So a recent study, which was highly criticized in the scientific community as being too dire, right? I, I criticize this paper just as strongly because the time frames I think are ridiculous. It's way, way too conservative. Stuff is happening much faster than the paper discusses. But you know, it looks at basically, it basically discusses how it, they'll be warming for centuries. Even if the greenhouse gases emissions were reduced to zero now in 2020, there would be warming for centuries according to this paper. So that's without, that's only if we deal with greenhouse gases. Okay, so clearly it's, it's, it's saying that we need to uh, do um, carbon capture and storage, we need to do some sort of climate hacking. And they advocate for um, both carbon removal from the atmosphere ocean system, but also for uh, solar radiation management techniques. They say that if we just remove carbon alone from the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, in two different scenarios. One is to um, have greenhouse gas emissions peak in 2070 and then go down to zero by 2100. That's scenario one. Scenario two is to have them reduced to zero immediately from 2020 and stay at zero. What would happen in scenario two? And of course, we can't do that. I mean, that's impossible, but it's a thought experiment. And they found that in both cases, the temperature would continue to rise. You know, it would peak, drop a bit, and then continue to rise for, for uh, centuries, for hundreds of years. You know, the long-term rise would be about 3 degrees Celsius um, versus 1850, um, or five, that's 5.4 Fahrenheit. But the time scales are utter bollocks, as I say. They're complete nonsense. I mean, they, they talk up to 2500, so, you know, why am I showing this paper? Because those numbers, you know, take th th those numbers and accelerate them to much more recent times. And then there's some merit in the paper results on that. The paper does say that we passed the point of no return about 50 years ago. So it was criticized by many people for, for that main reason. But anyway, let me go and show you some of the details of this paper now. Yeah. Okay, so this is the paper. Okay, an Earth system model shows sustained melting of permafrost even if all man-made greenhouse gas emissions stop in 2020. Now, even the title is suspect. I mean, melting of permafrost. You don't melt permafrost, you melt ice. If you melt ice, you get water. Now, in permafrost, it's frozen soil. Okay, so the water in the frozen soil, the ice will melt, but the permafrost, you thaw, okay? So this should say self-sustained thawing of permafrost. You don't melt permafrost, you thaw permafrost. You melt water, okay? There's a big difference here. So anyway, I'll talk about the details of this paper, but before I do that, I just want to remind you that this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. Please have a look at it, and please consider donating to support all my work in, in, in my videos. I've done hundreds and hundreds of videos. This is my YouTube channel. You can just Google YouTube Paul Beckwith um, and you can find all of my videos and you can do uh, searches for specific topics. And I've talked about everything, uh, you know, probably multiple times over the years. So please consider, you know, supporting this ongoing work. 
Okay, so on my Twitter page at Paul H. Beckwith, um, I posted uh, just something interesting I wanted to point out. This is a very beautiful, um, it's like art, but this is created naturally. Okay, Lake Baikal, okay, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Siberia, I believe. Huge lake, one of the biggest uh, freshwater lakes, deepest in the world. There's rocks lying, if there's rocks lying on the surface of the frozen lake, then in, in, during the day when there's sunlight, that heats the rock and it melts the cavity around the rock. It melts the ice around the rock because the heat, the shortwave radiation hits the rock, heats it up. Then it emit, emits the heat, emits infrared rays, and that melts the ice below. And then when the sun sets, the ice refreezes and it creates these incredible frozen, near impossible structures. So these rocks are like balanced up on a pinnacle of ice. And there is a, if you Google Baikal Zen, is, is, the, name of the, is the, the name that was coined for this phenomena. And so I'll have to try this. If you know, if you know a lake, um, you know, of course, the problem is, is, you know, when you get snow, it's going to cover the ice. I mean, this is perfect conditions where the ice is formed, but there's no snow and the ice is thick enough to support the rock. And then over time, you can get this sort of structure. You can sort of see this, um, you know, in Ottawa with the canal system, okay? When the canal system starts to freeze, the last place it actually freezes is underneath the bridges because the sunlight hits the bridges and the br bridges radiate heat out at night and that prevents the ice from uh, forming underneath the bridge. So that's the last place that the ice forms and it's also one of the first places that the ice melts in the spring, not only because the ice is thinner there, but because in the, uh, you know, winter's over, the warmer sun's heating the bridge up, bridge radiates out that long wave radiation and, and uh, melts the ice um, in the vicinity of the bridge faster than, than ice elsewhere. So that's the, the, the same phenomena is happening here. Um, Okay, so follow my Twitter account. Um, in Facebook, I've got a couple different accounts. So you can just Google my name in Facebook. And if you put in a friend request, say that you've watched my videos and I'll, I'll bump you up because I'm always sort of pushing, you know, near, near the upper limit. Um, so I tweeted, I, I put on Facebook and I tweeted out this article, any hope of keeping Earth habitable now requires sucking carbon back out of the atmosphere. So this is the press release and then I'm also d discussing the paper in, in detail. Um, this is uh, another Facebook page. This is a, a group. So I set up a group so any number of people can, can join here. I should probably change the image that one. So I look too orange in that one. And um, yeah, so there's loads of stuff that I post there. And okay, so this is the article, Business Insider, any hope of keeping the earth habitable now requires sucking carbon back out of the atmosphere, a new study finds. So basically what they're saying is, okay, so if we were to stop emitting greenhouse gases right now, the earth would keep warming for centuries. Okay, a new study shows, well, the time scale for CO2 warming is extremely long. It depends on how many processes remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, so they say we could go to zero emissions now and we keep warming for centuries, and that's with, but that's without geoengineering methods. That's without carbon dioxide removal or carbon capture and storage, and it's also without solar radiation management as well. Okay, so we need to do these um, climate restoration techniques, carbon dioxide removal, solar radiation management, to get out of to get out of this harsh reality that the planet will keep warming. Okay, so I'm going to continue this in another video. So thank you for listening.